Welcome to the Speak With People podcast. My name is Jason Rates. I'll be your host, and this podcast exists to help you improve your communication skills, whether you communicate one-on-one to a team, from a stage, or from behind a screen. We know that when we improve our communication skills as leaders, it exponentially changes everything. It improves our relationships, it improves our leadership skills, and it improves our business skills. So let's get ready to dive into this next episode. Well, how do you solve your sales problem? When problems come up with your company or maybe your team is not hitting their targets, how do you solve those problems? How do you attack them? How do you create solutions for those problems? Today, we get to interview just an incredible leader who wrote a a fantastic book and we're going to dive into all of that. And so today we're going to really discover some of the common symptoms that are facing many businesses. We're going to talk about you know some solutions to some revenue revenue shortages. We're just going to dive in to all things problem solving and how we can attack some of these kind of things. And I am so honored to have just an incredible leader with us. Uh, he's going to tell you more about himself. But Darius, welcome to the Speak with People podcast. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me, Jason. I'm so excited that you are with us, and uh, we both are privileged to call from some sunny areas today, Tampa and Southern California, so that works out nicely. <laughs> Absolutely, and I love Florida as well. Well, before we hop in to some of these questions, could you just tell us a little bit more about you know your story for our listeners who may not know you? Give us a little bit of your, your background and what you do and all those good kind of things. Absolutely, with pleasure. So I was born in Iran, raised in France, and now living in California for the past 15 years. So I'm truly multinational, um, familiar with six languages, writing and, and, and speaking fluently, like almost like natives, uh, English, French, and, and Persian. Um, so this gives me a perspective which helps me with communication uh, in different uh, areas, regions of the world. Uh, I, I facilitate workshops uh, in Japan, in Singapore, in India, uh, all over Europe, obviously, Helsinki, uh, Ireland, uh, and you name it. And of course, uh, the U.S. and, and, and being also... Uh, uh, coming to the U.S. and attacking an area like um, facilitating courses and speaking and uh, writing, these are usually not where immigrants uh, come to succeed. You know, they usually are in tech. I am in tech, obviously, but usually they are in tech functions. Uh, you know, for instance, just to give you an example, uh, the CEO of Google is an engineer, and and as he's an engineer, he's a CEO with an engineering background. He's not into sales, not into marketing, so it's rare. So that was by itself a challenge. I love challenges. Uh, that by itself was a challenge. So uh, back back to me um, with the uh, events uh, back in the uh, late seventies in Iran, uh, we had to move out of the country for political reasons. Uh, France. I landed in France uh, um, uh, as a teenager and um, was successful there. I I studied engineering, uh, robotics engineering. Um, I was lucky somehow I got to the uh, best engineering school and ranked first. So I I was not bad in in math, uh, in problem solving and and, uh, analytics and, and those things. And I started working as an engineer, um, you know, writing codes for robotics problems, uh, you know, complex problems. And after a few years, uh, I noticed that I'm doing the job and these salespeople are making the money and getting the commissions and so on. I said, no, this is not fair. Right. (laughs) (laughs) I'm solving the problem and they are getting the commission. So I want to move to sales. It was very simple, basic. Um, uh, interest and not hidden uh, attraction for money uh, and, and success was um, also related to money. I, obviously, today with uh, some gray hair, 
I, I, I realize that uh, money is part of success. It's, we can't deny it, but it's not uh, only that, obviously. Anyway, back to those days, uh, I, I moved to sales after a couple of years of sales, uh, you know, exceeding well above quota, 180% and 200% the, the first two years. I became country manager and, and the CEO of a subsidiary of that company, which is actually a Franco-American company called Schlumberger, a $6 billion company. But I, I had I, I was running a subsidiary of $10 million uh, business. So I became CEO of that company at age 28. Um, I was successful early in my career. I did a, a, I did a, few, uh, a few years there. Notice that corporate America or corporate international is not my thing, you know, uh, to, 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 uh, too many politics. And, and uh, I, I was, you know, a very simple guy, driven. Um, so I got interested in startups, uh, joined uh, a company called PTC, a U.S. startup. At the time where startups were not yet a thing, that we're talking about early 90s, um, 92 to be exact. Uh, and then um, as a country manager for for France, Southern Europe, for this U.S. company, um, and then later become uh, I became a uh, an entrepreneur. I founded four companies. I failed twice miserably, <laughs> had to shut down, and and I sold twice as well, um, two exits. And um, Medic Academy uh, is my fifth company and uh, seven years into it. It's the nature of Medic Academy and my company is different than the startups I had before in a sense that it has no goal for growth in terms of people or revenue. The growth is, is my growth. Uh, 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 there are a, a very limited number of people working, helping me in what I'm doing, but it's all about sharing what I've learned during all these years and, um, and you know, um, writing and, and, and teaching those things. That's, that's what I'm doing. Well, my goodness. I mean, I'm already writing down questions based on uh, some of your history and life experience. Wow. What a, what a fantastic uh, journey that you've been able to, uh, you've been able to take us on. Uh, CEO at 28, boy, that would have been, uh, I, I bet there was some challenges, especially with maybe older, older folks uh, in your company and, and <laughs> trying to get through them, you know, maybe, maybe possibly looking down at you. Absolutely. There, there were absolutely a lot of challenges, both the challenges of um, the young guy who is teaching us what, what to do. Yes. Uh, that, that was definitely part of it. And, um, you know, it's very hard to understand when someone is acting in a different way. Um, they are not totally honest what is behind, but behind that were these, these feelings. My solution to all of that was being open about things and, uh, you know, um, and, and accept those challenges and, and talk about them and then uh, offer solutions. Uh, you know, the reason I was there is was because I was doing, executing things in a certain way, which was working. And, and so yep. even if I was younger, maybe I had a few things that I could share with, but I had, I was ready also to learn from them and learn from their experience. Yes. Um, yes. That was part of the challenge. Another a biggest, cha bigger challenge than this was actually Jason, the fact that I had joined this first company as this geek, this genius technology geek who is solving all these complex robotics problems. And he's talking about, he want to go to sales. What the heck? <laughs> telling me, are you crazy? You are successful. You are considered as the god of robotics here. Everyone comes to you with solving this problem. And you want to go to sales? Everyone can do sales, more or less. 
And the worst part is that, Darius, you don't understand. You're going to fail miserably and it's bad for you and things like that. And then my family is saying similar things, not that harsh, but but they were saying, are you sure you want to go do that? It's just, you know, it's a pity you have done all these great studies. You want to go to sales, and then and then my uh, my alumni colleagues or, or friends who same thing, you know, other engineers who were seeing me as this um, uh, successful guy, but but he wants to go to sales, and and sales don't have sadly sadly don't have a great reputation because because of some elements, some bad apples in our business uh, who consider sales as playing tricks on people, you know? Um, and, and we can talk about this a bit later. The, the title of the book, Always Be Closing versus Always Be Qualifying, things like that. And uh, so um, the, the, that other challenge was actually uh, my motivation. The fact that I mean, I was no longer motivated into solving robotics problems. I've I've done that, I, you know. So it was more for myself that I wanted to prove to myself that I can also do these other soft skills, you know, communication and and uh, emotional intelligence, uh, and not not just uh, solving math problems. Yes. Wow. Wow. Do you think uh, you had some success in sales because y you knew the engineering side of it so well? Or do you think it didn't play that that big of a role in that? Great point, Jason. I don't think I would be successful in anything business to consumer type of sales because I was driven from the beginning. And it's the essence of what I'm teaching right now and I'm speaking about right now is to understanding the customer's problem and then bringing a solution to the customer's problem. That's sales, actually. Sales is about solving the customer's problem. So if you, are, you have the ability to analyze that, understand it, and convince, persuade the prospect that what you're offering solves their problem, voila, that's yep. how sales happen. Yep. Wow. No, that's fantastic. I've got more more questions I'll ask you at the, at the end about some of your journey. But, you know, you, you, you spoke on it just a little bit, the, the, the medic uh, program that you have created. Kind of walk us through the inspiration behind, you know, the methodology. How did your journey become to where you created this program? So that second company after... Uh, my first company at Schlumberger, second company was a startup. Startup started in, in Boston, and I was country manager in, in Europe, Southern Europe. I was running Southern Europe for this startup. And uh, it, 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 there were about 150-ish, 200 people at the company. Today, it's a more than $2 billion, uh, $2 billion company uh, with thousands of people working in the company. Wow. So, yeah, so the company had something interesting, a, 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 a great technology. It was computer-aided design, you know, whatever we design objects with uh, with this uh, mechanical design product uh, software. And um, we had something uh, innovative. Our product was uh, cutting-edge, disruptive technology, no doubt about it. But there are a lot of cutting technologies around us every day, not all of them become successful because no matter how good the technology is, you need to have a marketing and, and sales and other strategies to accompany that technological leadership. So that's, that's where I learned how, uh, what are the challenges and how you can fix them in order to expand a new technology fast. And our challenge at the time was to ramp up fast. We knew that the co competition will catch up with technologies which will be similar to ours or even better than ours. But maybe we had two years in front of us, maybe three years, maybe six months, who knows? So we had to go super fast. So I was hiring 
uh, salespeople from outside. And my number one challenge was that they ramp up fast. They generate quota uh, every quarter on a consistent basis, but fast. Not take them one year to get up, to, 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 to ramp up, but one quarter. So in order to do that, how do you do that? You do that by being able, as a leader, to tell them, to explain to them, and to show them how to do it. If you are joining a company and that your mentor, your coach, your manager is able to do it, hey, from the activity all the way to the goals, this is what you need to do. The, the problem with a lot of managers is saying, okay, this is your quota. You need to do, let's say, $100,000 a, a quarter or a month. This is your goal. Go get it. That's not enough. Uh, you, you need uh, to tell them, uh, in most cases, what activity is needed to do that. Do I need to do demos? How many phone calls should I place? Uh, what should I say in those phone calls? So I, they, they need guidance. They need to be helped. So we looked at how we can help the, the new uh, hires in order for them to go fast and how to articulate our best practices in a short, concise way. That was the beginning of what we call medic and medic uh for those of uh, the listeners who are not familiar with the methodology um stands for metrics economic buyer d as in decision criteria the second d as in decision process the i stands for identify pain and the c stands for champion who is the person within the customer, the account, who helps you win, who is selling on your behalf. Um, and then there's the MedPick, my version, uh, which adds two more letters, which are the paper process and the competition. And, and, and actually, um, so these, these elements are kind of checklists, kind of they they help you like a navigation system when you are selling inside the account am i doing the right things do i have metrics do i have elements of measuring how we can help this customer improve things like making more profit like saving time like doing things faster um th things like that but but please uh stop me when i'm talking too much or you want to <laughs> me add to some specific things no that's fantastic especially you know you look at some of the numbers out there and even with you know i mean more technology than we've ever had before i mean just even some of what the crm software does for sales these days with all the automatic emails and keeping track of everything uh you know for some sales is on a decline why do you think there's been this kind of continuous decline over the past 20 years, even though we have more technology, we have more services uh, than ever? Love this question. Love this question. The reason is that we think that some of these soft skills, we, we, are, we think that we can solve any problem with tools and technologies are used to automating things in the past three, four decades, automating, you know, software publishing, um, uh, uh, office automation, from office automation, from today, you know, the AI is a lot of automation, automation things here, automation, but there are things that we cannot automate. Look at our conversation. We are talking to each other and we are through these webcams. We are looking at each other and there is an emotional interaction in there. You are getting some vibes from me and I'm getting some vibes from our conversation. From you and, and this cannot be automated, man. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so it is so obvious when I'm saying it this way, but we forget that sales 
is about this. Sales is about human being connection. So, so long story short, the reason for that is that we have forgotten to provide skills to our sales teams. We forgotten to focus on skills and teaching them how to do things. And we are just automating. And by the way, most salespeople hate automation. They actually hate it that going onto salesforce.com and, and inputting things, etc. Most salespeople like interacting with the prospect, meeting the person, talking over the phone, going on a live conference, things like that. So the reason is the skills. We are not focusing on the skills. That's, that's why. And that, that's what I'm doing. That's, right. that's the focus of Medic Academy, bringing those skills. Despite myself, I mean, it's easy. I mean, my, my personality is the robotics engineer who has uh, found or cracked the code of sales through a process, through methods. Yes, methods and skills in order to become more successful salesperson but not tools everywhere. Even if I've been selling and developing and creating tools all my life, here at Medic Academy, I'm focused 100% on the skills, on human right. skills, soft skills. Right. What do, you, what do you think is the best way in 2024 for sales managers to motivate, inspire, encourage, you know, challenge their team? Because, you know, things have changed over the last... 20, 30, 40 years, you know, nowadays, what do you think? Are, are there some elements from, you know, the past that are just as effective today? Are there new, new ways to keep people encouraged uh, to keep, you know, tar- you know, keep looking at their metrics, targeting their goals, moving forward? You know, what advice would you give to a sales manager to keep their team fully engaged in, in attacking their, their goals? Yeah, uh, uh, before answering to that, uh, a comment you made, things have changed. We are in 2024. Um, I'm a big believer in the old methods. And when I'm saying old, it's not just 20 years ago. I'm I'm thinking 2,000 years ago. Uh, For instance, just to give you an example, and and, and I will get to your question specifically, for instance, I, I mentioned metrics as one of the elements of my methodology of MedPick, and which means that when we are uh, in a sales campaign with a client, um, it's important that we know the metrics. Means that how much the client is losing because of not this lack of this opportunity or this solution, and how much. They can improve with us, whether it is saving time or saving dollars or whatever it is. And this is not new. Aristotle, with, within the book Rhetoric, gives three elements how you can be convincing the art of persuasion. And, and he talks about ethos, uh, logos, and pathos as three pillars of how persuade someone and how do you have ethos how do you have the credibility that he refers to credibility comes from metrics how do you have logos which you know presenting something which is logical because you have proof and evidence with metrics <clears throat> so um so so sometimes of course if if we talk about Aristotle as 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 a methodology, people will look, look at you. You know this weird guy. What is he talking about? Uh, but if you understand what was behind that and what is behind these reasons, it helps uh, moving forward. So for the leadership, same thing. Uh, leading by uh, by example, uh, be, having a dual approach of helping, but also um accountability uh not letting things happen without any reaction if something is wrong you need to explain why it is wrong first of all and when it is repeated there should be 
uh, you know, uh, uh, a, a penalty for it. For it, if you are doing something, you, you need to lose something. It could be losing an account, to be losing something. And when it is, uh, they they have done, uh, they have achieved something which was part of their goal. It needs to be celebrated, compensated, reward for it, and and all this not being at your desk. You need. I I, I love managers and leaders who are hands in. Uh, hands on at least, but even sometimes hands in, meaning that walking with your salesperson into an account, being on a call so that you can help them understand exactly where they are missing those opportunities so that right. they can help Oof. otherwise you can't. Yeah. Oof. Boy, that is so good. When it comes to the problems that come up, you know, either in sales, uh, for the sales managers, even on the engineering side, you know, the the folks who are writing the code and making the things happen, what do you think gets in the way for some leaders uh, in the way that they have? they approach problems. You know, for some, it seems like it just totally stunts them. And for others, it seems like, you know, it, it, uh, it charges them up and they can't wait to solve a problem. You know, what do you think is the difference, you know, between the leader who's able to problem solve, you know, think through the solution and the leader who kind of gets stunted by it? What, what would some advice be for that leader? There, there are really uh, a lot of different things which can be uh, the, 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 the cause, the reason for that. Uh, one of them, which, uh, which is valid for newer leaders, is the lack of confidence, is not feeling themselves yet uh, confirmed in the role. So they are returning this to their people by asking for more results instead of being humble about what they're doing, sitting side by side and just asking, how's it going? Why? What is uh, in the way? Why do you think is not this is not working? And by the way, one of the um, very first thing that I always uh, recommend to leaders is when they are seeking for a, a problem, why someone is not performing, or if why someone missed their goals, whether a small goal, which is an activity goal for this week, or a, a results goal for the whole year is asking them, why do you think the reason is that? And not accepting um, excuses. Uh, so th- things, things like, you know, if, uh, uh, if, if you know, I, did, I had a bad territory, for instance. No, that's not acceptable uh, as a response. And, and, and of course, the, the leader needs to be fair if they have shared um, territories and define the territories for their sales team in a, in a in a fair equitable way there shouldn't be that question and and you know anyway uh, so uh, asking them how how um, things need to be done is one of the ways to do it but there can be a lot of different reasons I love that uh, failure is a part of <laughs> life. Uh, you know, we're going to have moments where things don't quite go the way we hoped. We put together a great strategic plan. We attempt something new. We, we lose a client. I mean, you talked about, uh, you know, you, you founded four companies, a, a, a couple didn't make it. What were some of the major building blocks that you learned, you know, from that process of, you know, maybe the results weren't as you hoped, and, you know, what was I able to learn to be able to, I mean, you kept, mo- you kept moving forward, you know, many don't. And so what, what kind of kept you moving forward? That's, that's a fantastic question. So uh, there are the huge differences between sales execution and the success of a company, of the success of a startup. Those, the cases that failed were the cases of product market fit, product market fit. The thing that, especially in the first case, the thing that I didn't realize was that I was successful during all my career until age of 40, had never had any failure. Each job successful, each job. 
Why? Because that was about execution. It, in other words, the product was already working somewhere, has already started somewhere. So there was a fit between the product and the market. And if I was applying and executing and, and, and doing the right thing, which is the sales, it would work. And it did work. When I became an entrepreneur um, and I had to create a product, I had a belief of a market. And that belief of the market was wrong. No market studies can be for sure, 100% sure. And sometimes the product that you're building will not fit that market. Once you have that product market, product and market, you may still think that you're going to solve these problems with your product. The only proof, evidence of this is when you have a few first customers who are on a long run successful. Many venture capital consider that the threshold for assessing this is, a, is $1 million revenue. Many people consider that when you reach $1 million revenue, it means that there is a product market fit. In order to grow further, you need execution. So I was good at the execution, but I couldn't imagine if this product that I was building going to be successful in that market. And it was not always. Twice, it was not. So that one, those are the reasons for the failure. Does that make sense? Um, absolutely. Absolutely. Boy, that's great. And just even knowing that going in, let, let me pivot just a little bit more because in the beginning, as you were kind of talking to us about our story, something kind of stuck out that, you know, I found so fascinating. At Speak With People, you know, we do a lot with helping, empowering leaders to improve their communication skills. Uh, we really believe that when a leader improves their communication skills, it has the opportunity to ex ex exponentially advance their influence, that the more effective they are at communicating, the more influence they're going to be able to have, the deeper the relationships and the connections. You communicate, uh, I mean, to people around the globe. <laughs> I'm just wondering, how have you been able to connect? I mean, I know you know multiple languages, but how have you been able to connect with leaders in India or leaders, you know, in a different country and still kind of find that common ground to be able to, whether it's through the Medic Academy or, you know, your, your history in tech sales and those kind of things, how have you been able to connect with people in a different culture and find that common ground so you can, you know, both understand what's being communicated? Well, the, the very first thing is the confidence. And in order to uh, uh, have confidence, and, and we can talk about the belief and building belief as, as well, but building confidence very shortly in this context would be that, hey, this person from India is, is just like you. They have the same problems as you, and they are willing, just as your American neighbor who is interested in learning from you, they are also interested in learning from you. So focus on what you can, where you can help them. What's the value of your, in my case, my sales methodology? What is in it? Uh, for instance, one of the uh, objections that sales leaders that I help and their teams uh, face is the following. This methodology that Darius is talking about is a kind of an American Western methodology. Here in Singapore, our culture is totally different. We don't do business like this. And, and my response to that, okay, let's assume that. How is the economic buyer or the CEO of this mid-sized company in Singapore solving the problem of profitability? The answer is that the same way as the American mid-sized company, which means increasing revenue or decreasing cost or both. And that's it. The key here is that, in my case, 
The key is that making them understand that corporations and companies have exactly the same problems. Now, I'm not saying the cultures are not different. Of course, they are different. That's why we have different salespeople in different geographies. That's why we, we, don't, we don't send an American in Singapore to sell to Singaporean people. We select the local person because of the language, because of the way you shake hands, because of the way you give your card in, in Japan and you bow a little bit and, and respectfully give your business card, not throwing with one hand, for instance, just giving an example. Uh, so these are the cosmetics of the cultural interactions between human beings that I trust them to know. They just know it naturally. There is no value of me explaining or teaching uh, that far from that. I'm learning from them. But on the foundation of the businesses, how corporations improve their profit and their profitability and their functioning, it's all the same everywhere. Wow. Wow. Oh, I love that. I love that. And just brilliant. And, you know, you, you take us, you know, from the complex side of it and you make it, you know, very, very practical. And so I just so appreciate that. Uh, we could probably talk for another hour or so. Uh, let me ask you some rapid fire questions. I, I asked this, you know, of all of our guests on the podcast, because we're building a library of all of the best resources that our guests recommend. And so, you know, we, we, analyze and look at a lot of speakers on this podcast is there a speaker for you who you you just love you just love to listen to whether it's you know the leadership development or you know they're teaching you a new uh, a new gift or a new skill is there someone that just you know sticks out to you yeah well i may not be your typical uh guest in that regards because my podcasts are mostly when i'm uh, walking by the beach or driving those are the times uh, where i listen and they are more i'm more interested in entertaining uh conversations than than learning uh i i'm, I'm i have enough of learning at my <laughs> desk or at my office so yep. my, and, and they are french i mean i have uh Chian Hojandi, a french mm. um, a french uh uh, actor actually who who has a podcast and and actually my my 30 years old son who's a top podcaster in france uh the uh, the podcast called zin zin uh, zan zan french uh and um his name is cyrus north uh so these are some just to give you two examples of yes that i listen i um, not sure if uh, most of your clients would be interested uh, in, in French, but who knows? Uh, ah, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And is there a book? Uh, is there a, you know, this is the book that you recommend to people, either leadership or sales, that, you know, you've, it, it's made a giant difference in your life. You've, you've given it to others. Is there some book that you would recommend? Yeah, I, I have a strong belief is that whatever the book they are reading, the key is not the content of the book, but how they can change their habits in order to apply it. And because of that, I highly recommend, um, maybe they are very famous and don't need my recommendation, but I still do it, um, Atomic Habits and, and Seven Habits of Highly Successful People. So... Uh, because if we, we can, we learn how to apply these habits, when I am talking about always be qualifying, for instance, versus always be closing, or medic, they should be able to transform these ideas into habits. Yeah. Ooh, so powerful. So powerful. Well, before I do finally let you go, where's the best place to send our listeners to find out you know, more about your program, your book, you know, what you do online. Absolutely. So my book is always be qualifying. Uh, they can buy it on Amazon. Um, and my name, uh, Darius Lahutifat on LinkedIn is my preferred, uh, professional network, social network. Uh, and this, the website is medic Academy. There is a blog on the website, 
the Aristotle article, for instance, is one of the latest article there. And it's M-E-D-D-I-C dot academy. M-E-D-D-I-C dot academy. Ah, wonderful. Well, we will link all of those in the show notes and we'll put all this information uh, in our Speak With People community Facebook group, which if you're listening to this and you've not become a member of, it is a thousand plus leaders from around the world as we lean in and try to learn how to increase our communication skills so we can expand our influence. And we love promoting our podcast guests, books and resources. And Darius, we will put all of this in there as well. I can't thank you enough. This has been so rich. You've poured into us and so incredibly practical. So thank you so much. I am the one to thank you, Jason. I'm uh, very grateful to be your guest and wish you excellent podcast now in the future. Well, thank you very much. Appreciate it. And thank all of you for being a part of our listening community. We really do appreciate every single review, every single time you rate the podcast and you like it. Uh, Thank you so much for checking out this episode. We'll see you in the next one. Thanks. Thank you. Well, thank you for joining us on another episode of the Speak With People podcast. We hope that you were encouraged. We hope that you were inspired and challenged to improve your communication skills. I want to thank you again for being a part of the Speak With People podcast community. Make sure you don't miss out on being a part of the Speak With People Facebook community group. Just head to Facebook, type in Speak With People, scroll down and join our community because every single day we're encouraging each other. We're helping each other to improve our communication skills. Thanks again and we'll see you in the next episode.